Please uh, take your Bibles and turn back with me, if you will, to those scripture passages that we read just a few moments ago. We're actually going to be looking at a lot of other passages in addition to those two, but that's our starting point because the Bible has a lot to say about God's kind of love, human love, passionate love, family love. There are many different kinds of love in the Bible that we've talked about in the past. But I would like to mention one practical thing before we begin, and you are all invited to the Valentine's Sunday dinner over in the church fellowship hall immediately following the service. But we need proof of love, proof of love. Often after the dinner is over, everybody sort of scoots out and figures somebody else will clean up. But today, let's show our love with all the ladies staying afterward to help clean up, and the men can help put away the tables, too. I set them all up. I trust you will help me take them down. Okay, so now we are over to our passages in John where Jesus is talking about love. And uh, today, of course, we're moving very quickly toward what is called Valentine's Day. You know the story of the early Christians who uh, went through many persecutions, and there was one by the name of Valentine who was imprisoned for his faith. And while he was in love, he fell uh, while in prison, yeah, while he was in love, he fell in prison. No, no, no. While he was in prison, he fell in love with the jailer's daughter and she with him. And each day, he would reach through the bars of his cell outside and pull a, a, a leaf. Now, we don't know if this is true, but this is a story anyway. And he'd puncture these fingernails with the words, I love you, and drop it for her as she would go by. And he died a martyr's death without ever being able to fulfill his love for her. Well... That's not the way the world looks at it today. They have a lot of paganism in it. But the Bible does have a lot to say about love. The first point I want to make is a strong connection that love has to what we were talking about last week. I hope you remember the message last week. It was centered around one word with four letters in it. Who remembers what that word is? It begins with an F and ends with an R. Yes, fear, fear. We were talking last week about fear and say, well, you know, fear, what has that got to do with Valentine's Day? What's that got to do with love? Uh, what we learned was that fear was the opposite of faith. Either you walk by fear and fear will control your life and all the decisions that you make, or you will walk by faith. Faith in the absolute promises of God and that will control your life and all the decisions that you make. So you say, well, okay, so what does that have to do with love? After all, isn't this a celebration of Cupid and bows and arrows and pink hearts and red roses? <laughs> well, it certainly isn't about Cupid, the companion of Venus, the pagan Roman goddess of physical lust. That's not what this holiday is about. But the Bible does talk about love. Now, you've heard me preach that there are four kinds of love. Number one, agape. That's God's kind of love. Number two, philos, verbal form phileo, human friendship. You've heard me talk about storge, and it's only found in the negative in the New Testament, but that's family kind of love. And then there's, ah, oh, here's where the world focuses. There's eros. That's erotic love, passion, sexual love. The world focuses on number four and twists what love is really all about. But today I want to focus on biblical love and that love which we are commanded, not suggested, that we are commanded to have. Okay, so back to that question I asked you just a moment ago. So what in the world does fear have to do with love? What does fear have to do with love? Scratching your head. We actually looked at one of the verses last week, but I want to focus on the second verse that we didn't look at last week. I want to focus on that verse today. But here's what we studied last week. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Look at the contrast. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Oh, hmm, that's one of the ones that's stuck in contrast to fear, isn't it? But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, last week I talked about how fear destroys power how fear destroys love, 
How fear destroys a sound mind. You cannot make right decisions when you're trembling and agitated and, and scared out of your wits. It destroys your power. You don't know what to do. You don't have any strength to do it. Here comes the bear. You're trembling. You fall down on the ground. Here comes the enemy troops over the rise. They got submachine guns. Communist pictures on their helmet. And you're afraid. And you run. Destroys power. Destroys love. We're focusing on that today. Fear destroys love. It destroys a sound mind. But now, listen to this. So how do you get rid of fear? How do you get rid of fear? I think the answer may surprise you, but here's the second verse I want to look at today. 1 John 4, 18. Listen to it carefully. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. And if you didn't get it at the first part of the verse, listen to it again. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Whoa. So fear and love do have a nexus, don't they? There is some kind of a connection. If you've got fear in your life, you know what? You don't have perfect love. Love goes to the ultimate extreme it stands up to whatever danger there is because of the one loved it doesn't flinch in the face of death greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend What's the next verse? Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Interesting connection between obedience and love. But Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It doesn't say if a man lay down his life for the, the girl that he sort of likes a lot. It doesn't even have to have romantic love involved doesn't even have passionate love involved. Doesn't even have to have family love involved. A man who lays down his life for his friends. Laying down your life for someone else is the ultimate proof of love. Jesus told us that because that was what he was about to do. He didn't have some kind of a passionate relationship with his disciples. He didn't have a passionate relationship with you and me. He didn't have a passionate relationship with them because they were his brothers. Oh, in the spiritual sense, yes, but not his physical brothers. He didn't have a, some kind of a, a relationship with them because merely this is the love of God kind of thing. And God generally loves the world. But they were his friends. They were his friends. Greater love hath no man than this. The man lay down his life for his friends. You've all heard the stories of a man who risks his life to go and save a friend who's in a burning car. You've heard the stories of Men who are so close to their platoon that when the enemy comes over the hill, they fall on a grenade to save the rest of their friends. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment how many of you have ever had fear in your life and you've got this torment that goes on in your mind and it happens over and over and over and over and over and over again and you play it back it's like a, a loop 
that plays over and over again. And what is going to happen? What is going to happen? What is going to happen? What is uh, 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 if, if 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 this if this if this? If you understand love, the four kinds of love. If you understand God's kind of love for you, how that will reflect in your obedience to Christ, God's love that he gives you as a human being for others who are your friends, Paul says, by love, serve one another. When we're dealing with the authority above us, love is proved by obedience. When we're dealing with love on an equal level, it's proved by serving. When we deal with love of the one above for the one below, it's proved by sacrifice. Sacrifice of everything. Are you in a position of authority? Those under your authority, you want to prove you love them? You learn to sacrifice. You learn to sacrifice. You learn to sacrifice. We as men tend to forget that part. We remember the part about, you know, if you're under authority, a love says you're going to obey me because I'm the one in authority. And Jesus said, so, oh, Hannah, you better obey me. <laughs> we say that to our wives and kids. But there's the love that comes first. If the husband reflects Christ, the husband will love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, do you love, Christ, love your wife as much as Christ loved the church? That's quantitatively. Let's look at qualitatively. Do you love your wife in the same manner as Christ loved the church. Do you love your wife to the extent that Christ loved the church? It was an unfailing, invincible, eternal love. Husbands, do you love your wives that way? If not, why not? It's not a suggestion. It is a command. And perfect love casts out fear. When you love someone that way, you're willing to die for them. You're willing to stand between them and danger. You're willing to protect them no matter what it costs you. Love from above sacrifices for and protects those underneath. That must come first before you can expect love underneath to be obedient to you. If you want to prove that you're Jesus' disciples, Jesus said, by this, shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. That love is proved by service. That's what the scripture says, by love serve one another. So it doesn't matter which level you're at, top level, middle level, bottom level, Love has visible demonstrations of what we are supposed to be doing in the real world around us, how we are supposed to be interacting with the people who are around us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, that verse is in the context of the love of God which he has for us and how we are to imitate it toward others. Look, going back to verse 16, this is where in 1 John 4, and we have known and believed the love that God hath toward us. Here's the declaration of the character and nature of God. God is love. 
And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Pretty blunt. You know, we sort of get along with each other. We sort of tolerate each other. We sort of get from here to there, you know, day by day, and just hope that uh, we're not, you know, tripping over some other believers who are deliberately trying to get in our way, that kind of stuff. And that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the way God loves you. We have known. We've got it in our head. We have believed. We've got it in our heart. The love that God hath to us. Do you understand the love that God has toward you? And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us? The love that God hath to us. God is love. That is his character. That is his nature. He that dwelleth in love. We're talking biblical love. Dwelleth in God. You live in him. You move in him. You breathe in him. You have your being in him. Paul quotes that in his sermon on Mars Hill in Acts 17. The world understands that. Many Christians don't. And God in him. When you manifest that love, it's telling something about what's inside you. Because if God is dwelling in you, you can't restrain his love pouring out of you to others. Is that what you're known for? When other people think of you, do they think of the love of God in you? Do they think of you as a person who just exudes, it squeezes out of your pores, you can't help it. The love of God in practical real life. Is that how they think of you? If you're honest, when people look at you, when people think about you, when people have interactions with you, when people remember you, is the first thing that comes to their mind the love of God? I think if I'm honest, that isn't true for me, and I want it to be true. By love, serve one another. I want to be able to serve. I want to show Jesus that I love him. I want to obey his commandments. I want to make sure that when I'm under authority that I obey authority commandments too. When I'm in authority that I demonstrate the love of Christ to those under my authority. Three different levels. All of us at some point and to some extent are involved in all three levels. Does the love of God show through us. And then our verse, well first, verse 17, here in us our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Ah, we're going to give an account for our love? Yes, that's what he says. Because as he is, so are we in this world. In other words, the world is watching you. What do they see? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Not all disciples know that you're my disciples. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If and he doesn't list 14 points. He lists one. If ye have love one for another. That's a pretty tough call. You can't squeeze around and say, well, I got point number two and three, but I didn't get point number one. I mean, I know point number one is important, but he didn't give you points two and three. He didn't give you point 17. He gave you one point by which all men, even the pagan world, will know that you are my disciples, says Jesus. If ye have love one for for another. And it's not some kind of ephemeral thing that floats out there in space and puts a, a mild platonic smile on your face. It's by the way in which you serve one another. Sacrifice for one another. Obey those in authority over you. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. That's a rather significant point. I have many points. I hope we can get through a few more of them. But let me read you the rest of the passage. Here in his love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. You're going to get called to count for this. 
Because as he is, so are we in this world. How was Jesus in this world? You want to find out how Jesus was in this world? You can start at the Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But as he is in this world, what was Jesus like when he came and walked in, you know, sandal leather here on earth and lived on earth for 33 years? What did he do? Well, we don't have a whole lot about his childhood. We got some about his birth. We know when he went to Jerusalem uh, uh, when he was 12. Uh, but there are lots of silent years in there, aren't there? But the Bible gives us an awful lot about who Jesus is and what he did as you go through the four Gospels and you put it together and you find out what was he like. He was the visible manifestation of the love of God on earth. As he is in the world, he says, did you get that last phrase? So are we in this world. When you're walking in your sandal leather on planet earth, do people see Jesus in you? That is, he was totally fearless, wasn't he? Perfect love casts out fear. He was willing to tell people how it is, why it is, and the fact that if they didn't get right with God, they were in serious trouble. When was the last time you challenged somebody and told them that? Or did you just overlook their lifestyle? You just sort of thought, well, I'll sort of squeeze by this one and hope somebody else witnesses to them because they get mad when you talk to them about God. They're controlling you with fear. Someday you give an account for that. Perfect love casts out fear. If you love them the same way that God loved you, the same way God loved the world and gave his only begotten son, the same way that Christ loved you, you're in his love that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Folks, we'll give an account for every time we did not show the love of Christ while we're walking in sandals here on earth. That's what it just said. And then our verse, there's no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You're not mature yet. That's a small mark of maturity. Teleos. Maturity, made perfect, not made complete, not made whole. You're not grown up yet if you don't have this. And then that wonderful, beautiful verse. Why do we love God? It tells us in verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. He was the instigator, if you will, of love. He took the lead. We didn't say, oh God, we love you, we love you, we love you. Please love us, please love us. Oh God, please love us. Please help us out of our sinful, wretched condition. God said, oh well, I guess I have to do it. They're begging me. And uh, yeah, I guess they love me. So, okay, uh, let's, let's write down a formula. Uh, I love these people. Uh, Jesus, go down. He didn't do that. We love him because, not in spite of, we love him because he first loved us. It's not, we loved him, and so God begrudgingly said, I guess I'll love them too. We love him because he first loved us. God was the initiator in the relationship. Now here's where the rubber meets the road, the practical shoe leather, verses 20 and 21. If a man say, I love God. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, if, if I was going to take a poll here today, let me ask for a show of hands. How many of you here would say, I love God? Oh, some hands didn't rise up. Some people here don't love God. Ah, okay, that's all right. If a man say, I love God, do people say this? Yeah, you all just said it, or at least most of you said it. I love God. Look at the next phrase. And hateth his brother... He is a liar. Oh, how dare you call me a liar? Well, if you don't love God, you're a liar. Oh, you hate your brother? You hate somebody? Somebody you just can't tolerate. You would love to see them run over by a semi-truck. You would love for them to be over at the Olympics, visiting the Olympics, 
and suddenly the North Koreans come storming in and shoot up a bunch of people, and they got one of the bullets. <laughs> If a man says he loves God and hates his brother, I didn't say it, the Bible says it. He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? That's basic logic, 101. Oh, I love something I can't see. I hate the stuff I can see. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 but, but there's a lot of bad stuff out there. Yeah, I hate this kind of bad wickedness, and I hate the devil, and I hate his demons. And I, you know, well, How about other Christians? We're talking about brothers here. We're talking about brothers. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, God says, you are a big fat liar. He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen. Your brother, somebody Christ died for, somebody who's trusted Christ, somebody who is desperately struggling in their Christian life to, to learn to walk by faith, someone who's growing in Christ, someone who loves the Bible and wants to know God better and better and better. And you despise them. You say, they're at the bottom of the barrel. I'm really up here at the top. I've been a Christian for many years and I'm pretty cool. And boy, do I... I think uh, when we stand up there, I'm going to get one of the good seats <laughs> to that person over there. Nah, I don't like him. I don't like him at all. I wish they'd go someplace else. Do you feel that way? God says you're a liar. He that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Now, and here is a great suggestion from God if you feel like it. That's how this verse, next verse starts. And here's a great suggestion from God if you feel like it, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Is that what that verse says, verse 21? <laughs> you know, that's not King James for sure. And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God love God his brother also. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. If you're a believer, God just gave you a commandment. God just gave you a commandment. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. What's one of the commandments? Here's the commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Why does God require that? goes back to what we just said a minute ago. By this, that is the love that you have one for another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciple. Do you think God wants you, to know, uh, the, God wants you, the world, to know that you are a disciple of Christ? Do you think that God wants the world to know that you're a disciple of Christ? If you think yes, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. God wants us, God wants the world to know that we're disciples of Christ. Well, he says, here's how you do it. If ye have love one for another. He's not talking about our love toward God. We've already got that. Now he says, I want you to show it to people. He's not talking about erotic love. That's quite obvious because they're supposed to love one another. He's talking about the kind of love on the three levels that we talked about a moment ago. Under authority, we obey authority. Same level, by love, serve one another. When we're in authority, we sacrifice for those under our authority. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another and it's going to be visible and the world's going to see it and they're going to understand that because that's something they don't almost ever see and it will draw their attention. It will catch them by surprise. They'll say, these are Christians. We know them by their love. Ah. Oh. We're talking about love today. Love 
in 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, charity, but the greatest of these is charity. That's agape. That's God's kind of love. When you demonstrate the kind of love that God had when he sacrificed his son, he gave everything for you. Let's see uh, how Jesus loves with that in mind. We've got five minutes to go through 500 verses. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 100 a minute, yeah, hurry up, hurry up, right? <laughs> Matthew 5, 43, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? <laughs> Ooh, well, a minute ago we were talking about loving the brethren and say, well, man, that was, that's a hard enough yeah. one to swallow. <laughs> but how does Jesus love? Well, I mean, yeah, you know, we're his brethren. I mean, the book of Hebrews talks about how he came to, you know, save brethren. And uh, so, yeah, I guess we a lot to learn to love each other. Jesus takes it further, doesn't he? Not only do you love your brother, not only do you love your neighbor, but you don't hate your enemy. God's not involved in hating people. And he doesn't want you to be that way either, even if they are your enemy. Suppose they've declared themselves your enemy and they've told you to your face they're going to do everything they can destroy you in your company, for example. They're going to spread lies about you. They're going to spread rumors about you. They're going to spread slander about you. They're going to do everything they possibly can to nail you to the wall and get you fired. Now, you have a couple of options. You can say, I think I'll just resign and go someplace else where I have to deal with it. A lot of people do act like that. And the enemy gloats. <laughs> I got rid of them. Or you can say, I'm going to fight it tooth and nail, and I'm going to do it by spreading worse rumors about them than they could ever even think of, because they're kind of stupid. They can't think of very good rumors, but I can think of some really good ones, and I've got some dirt on them, and I'm going to let that go through the office grapevine until it reaches the boss. I know. I know who I can talk to so that it'll get up to the top, <laughs> and then I'll see them get fired. Or you can say, Lord... Help me to love this very obnoxious person. Help me to do for them what Jesus would do for me. At the Last Supper, our Lord Jesus Christ, when supper had ended, took a towel and girded himself and picked up the basin and began to do the lowest, dirtiest, most humble job that should have been done by a servant. It could have been done by any one of the disciples, but they were all busy thinking about how cool and how big they were, and they were having dinner with Jesus, and this was Passover, and wow, it's just us. And he began to wash their feet, and then he took the towel and dried them. And after he'd finished, and Peter said, don't do it, and Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then, <laughs> you know, you have no part in me. And Peter said, oh, no, no, Lord, no, 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 let's, not, let's not go there. Why? He washed the all of me. Give me a bath. <laughs> Jesus said, you don't need to be washed all over um, just your feet. And then he put away the towel, and he said, you know what I've done unto you? He says, if I've done this unto you, and I'm your Lord and Master, you ought to to do this for one another. Yesterday, in preparation for this time today, I thought, you know, I need to do something like this to prove that I love these people. I spent over two hours yesterday collecting trash from around the three buildings where it had built up over the last four or five months and nobody had ever put it into the dumpster. I thought, here's a way I can prove 
that I love these people. This is foot washing. Perhaps some of you have walked by some of the garbage cans in the kitchen, in the gymnasium, in the hall, in the school building, in this building. Many cans around this building, different locations, out in the lobby, upstairs both ends, downstairs both ends, restroom, lots of other places. In here there are two cans. <laughs> there are a lot of garbage cans around the buildings. I filled a bag, literally, this tall and this big around. Wow, okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, people, I love you. I'm not very successful at that, at showing that. I'm a man, and I know I use that for an excuse that I don't show love as well as other people do. But um, by love, serve one another. In just a few moments, we're going to be going over to the uh, Fellowship Hall, and you're all going to be enjoying a very nice dinner that the ladies have prepared, thanks to Kathy organizing and assigning jobs and things like that. But the one thing that doesn't often happen afterwards is ladies who stay and help clean up. By love, serve one another. Not just doing the fun things. By love, serve one another. Do some foot washing. Well, I had much, much more here. But Jesus talked about love a great deal, and he talked not only loving neighbors, not only loving friends, not only loving other brothers and sisters in Christ, he talked about loving our enemies and blessing those that curse us and doing good to them that hate us and praying for them which despitefully use us and persecute us. We have a ways to go, folks. Well, there's much more I'd like to say, but I can tell you that means, since I've already written all this stuff out, I got to page three out of ten pages. I have next year's sermon already. <laughs> Do you love God? If you hate your brother, Jesus says you're a liar. You understand the three levels of love, how we interact with one another? Love, if you're on top, means you sacrifice people underneath you. Love in the middle, you serve one another. Love underneath, you obey. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. And now we thank you that your word has declared that love is the solution to fear. Perfect love casts out fear, for fear hath torment. If we don't have love, we will have fear. And we have to have the kind of love that you talk about, that you describe in your word, the thing that draws us closer to one another in the body of Christ. Thank you, Father, for the practical application of the theological truth that we know in our heads but sometimes don't practice in our lives. Help us to love like Jesus loved. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we have that final hymn and head over for the food, let me just say one other thing. I was thinking, how can I do this so we can emphasize by our dinner to together today that, uh, that we have that unity? Usually we set up individual tables and different people choose different tables and sit everywhere. I have set the tables up in sort of a circle so that we'll all be sitting at the same table together. <laughs> I hope you can join us. Let's stand to sing our final hymn today. It's hymn number 606, Oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go, number 600.